we go. Uh, there she Whoa, is. Look at that, the mural technique. I just want to see. How are you guys? Sorry about the leg. I, uh, I don't have a very good signal. I've been running around trying to find my best location. Okay. Hi, I'm Cindy Nelson, and I, I'm teaching here at SIU. I used to work at CNN, and we're so glad you could be with us. This is an honor. Yeah, it really is. So, guys, before... The pleasure is mine. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Before we get into everything, I just want to give you some background on Soledad O'Brien, because she is a force to be reckoned with. She currently has a, <laughs> is a host of her show called Matter of Fact, uh, which airs on more than 100 TV stations around the country, and it has brought the Sunday talk show up to a new level. She looks at socioeconomic and political issues facing the United States. Uh, she is a former news anchor for NBC and CNN and MSNBC. She also has her own production company. She's a documentarian. Um, she created the document, documentary series In America, Black in America, Latino in America. She has Emmy Award winning. She's won the Peabody Award. She's also an author. And last but not least, she's a mom. So thank Aww. you so much. <laughs> we appreciate this. And Probably yeah. first and most dramatically, right? And a mom, right? <laughs> Yes, exactly. yeah, so we're just going to start and I'm just going to ask you a few questions to get us started. Um, so what for you, um, starting off as a reporter, would you tell our students here, which are their students from audio journalism, and they're also from a TV production, and also from international journalism classes. Is, what are the best skills that they could, should be working on right now? Oh my gosh, I'd say step one, know that there are skills, right? So think about what skills that you're bad at, that you're good at, and that you're great at. I used to really keep track of it like that. Like, okay, here are the things I'm rock star, and these are the things I'm okay, and these are the things I'm terrible. And then you basically have to keep moving things from the terrible column to things that you're tackling and trying to figure out. So my advice to people is, oh, what is your skill? And how do you grow your skill set? And what helps you as you're getting, getting offers and moving up the ladder, you can actually think about your skill set. You know, make sure that you're not just traveling laterally. I did X over here, now I'm doing the same thing over there. And not only just moving for more money, but making sure that you're going to learn new skills and you're going to use different skills. So it's all about thinking about your job as skills. What kind of skills do you have um, and what kinds of ways in which you can leverage those skills? So I think that that's the first thing. But I think most of the skills you need are being able to speak clearly, uh, get your point across. There's a little bit of noise behind me, so it's not too... Um, Getting, being able to speak clearly and concisely, getting your point across, and making sure that you're, if you have a message, you're delivering that message. You know, it's something you have to work on. It takes a while to, I guess I describe it as find your voice. You know, what's your point of view? What's your voice? And all those things are things that you could be working on right now as students. You don't need someone to give you a show. You have your own show. You can be doing a TikTok show. You can be doing a show on Instagram. You can literally create content all the time and figure out, oh, I like this, good at this. I look good in this outfit. Oh, I, I mean, I would do things like, I used to turn my neck like this. I mean, it was so weird. Why would I do that? But, you know, just things that made it visually distracting for people are things that I had to work on. I think it's as simple as that. Keep a list. What do you want to work on? Where do you want to go? And then also probably the other really important skill is to, to be flexible. I think one of my greatest skills is that if plan A doesn't work, I go to plan B. Plan B didn't work, I go to plan C. And usually my mom, who is very good at giving advice and somewhat bossy, so she gave a lot of advice, uh, used to say all the time, you know, spend 24 hours to c cry about it if something doesn't work out. But then, then in hour 25, move on. Start your list. Get going. Pick up a new thing. And I think it's really good advice. Like mourn for the thing that didn't happen. You didn't get that opportunity. Oh, you thought you were getting something. It didn't happen. But then hour 25, start a list. Okay, what's next? What could go on this new list? What could replace it? It's a very good skill for a reporter 
because when you're a reporter, you land in a location and you think, you, well, you know this, right? You land somewhere, you think you have a story, and then you don't have a story or your story changes or you never really get to land. You thought you were going to land and now you have a different story. And so sort of being able to be flexible and on your toes um, is a really important skill, I think. Okay. Um, your signal is a little, oh, now it's, now it's working. Oh, you no. were frozen before. Is it better? Yes, you still oh, have audio. Me, sorry. That's okay. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Okay, no worries. Time. But we're just going to keep on going. Um, so tell us, like, what is some of the best advice you received uh, from a mentor? I know you mentioned your mother, but what's some of the best advice you received from a mentor in the business? Sure. I'll tell you a great story. So I used to do a morning show in my first TV job, which was at WBZ TV in Boston. And I did the morning show and then the Today Show, it was a show that came on before the Today Show. It was at NBC station at the time. And I would run from my little job as an associate producer to this meeting, the morning meeting. And every single time there was a guy in there who I love him, but he used to make a crack about me running on color time, CP time, because I was always four minutes late to the morning meeting because the show ended with the hour. And I remember, I was so mad. I was furious. I was constantly frustrated and annoyed and pissed off. And I'd sit around and come up with, you know, when I see him, if he says this, I'll say that. And if he does this, and I'm going to do that. I left that job about a year later, got an opportunity to go to NBC News. And I never saw him again. I have not seen him for 30 something years. And I, I look back now and a, a mentor said that to me. She's like, let go of the stuff you don't need. I wasted so much time on this dude who did not even matter, formulating my comeback, being pissed off about it, getting angry, coming up with, I said that, and just, right, like, so do matter. And I think that's really good advice because everyone who's uh, learning about journalism in any job, not just journalism, is going to have that person who is, rude they or they're just you know just racist or they're just inappropriate or they just think they're funny and they're not right and they're going to knock you off your game and i spent a lot of time kind of being knocked off my game and thinking about that a lot of brains versus just oh listen buddy i see you i'm not going to be knocked off my game by you you do not matter in this equation and i wish i'd learned that earlier i mean i figured it out after that and it ended up being great advice to just not derailed by someone who's going to say stupid, petty, mean, nasty, inappropriate thing. Um, but I wish I earlier because it's really important to kind of keep your eye on where you want to go. You might change that path of where you want to go, but don't get distracted because you throw up stuff in your way. That is, that's a jewel because, yeah, if you guys get that now, that's going to be incredible. Because there, there's always going to be one person wherever you go and work that that's going to be the case. Always. 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 And you waste so much energy on them, right? Like yep. the thing is not that they they don't deserve to be to be called out. It's that you don't have energy to waste when you've got a things cooking. Yep. So, so what have been some of your biggest challenges? I mean, you've gone from... I mean, you, you've had a career that's just incredible. So, but can you talk a bit about how you were challenged getting there? You know, I've been very fortunate and I think what I've done well is to work very hard and I think everybody works hard. So I don't think that's a, uh, I think that's a skill, but a lot of people have that skill. I think it's a combination of hard work and luck and being a little bit brave intake management really prepared to do and also I think being a bit vulnerable to see the people I just don't understand this thing again can you help me get better can you help me can you help me can you help me um times have people that I try to give advice to and they don't really want it and so I stopped trying um and I think I was always pretty open to advice uh and that was really helpful so you know I wouldn't say it's some really horrible experiences. I, I think everybody in every career kind of has people who stand in your way, being really clear about where you want to go and also clear about the quality of your work, right? Like one thing I learned when we were doing the Black in America documentary series is like, if you're the kind of person who is going to say at the end, well, I didn't make this decision. So-and-so told me to do it. You're 
probably not going to get there far. You're the kind of person who, I made what I thought was the right call, and here's the thing. Horribly wrong call, but at least it's my call, my job. And the buck stops with me. And you know, that's a kind of, that quality of something is you're responsible for that. Not just a little tiny chunk of land that they've assigned you, but the big picture of quality. I've always got people who will say, and it isn't right, right? They're not wardrobe, but, but they are like, my job is to look at this show. And the look of the show is bad. Even if your hair is bad, if you look bad, we all look bad. You know, so they'll weigh in. Or someone who says, I, I feel, you know, you sound really muffled. Or someone who says, you know, I just don't think the lighting is working for you. Uh, I always found people like that who kind of step out of what their job is. And they do it carefully. Nobody wants them to step into their corner. Um, but I've always appreciated that they look at the show as they're responsible for the quality of the show. We all are. We all are. And so um, I think that, that that was probably the most important thing to learn, to come to, was being able to say, like, I'm responsible for all of it. If there's an error, it's, it's, it's my mistake. You're right, right? Like, it's, I'm saying it. I'm, I'm responsible. I think that was a very good lesson to learn and um, to overcome because once you decide that you're going to be responsible, and you go back and ask for it. Can you explain this to me? Can you show me the fact check? Can you show me the data on this? This doesn't seem right to me. I had to be more read in. I had to kind of up the quality of my work to make sure we were delivering more quality. Okay. We've lost your video, but the audio is still there. It's a little in and out. But oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Am I back now? I haven't moved. Oh, okay. <laughs> Zoom. Yes. You know what? We're not going to let this stop us. We're, we're going to keep going. Um, so yeah, let's keep going. Maybe I'll pop back up. Is that yeah. better? No. Um, well, how is the? How do you think the future of journalism looks? We've gone through an era where we were just more focused on TV, but now it's more multimedia, and it's everywhere. You can, like you said, have a show on TikTok or. Uh, your videos back <laughs> show on TikTok or on Instagram. I think it's a great time. I think, yeah. a great time. I think we're we're moving into a time where people are thinking about platform and reaching audience. Um, when I started my company, I remember people we'd go pitch things to network, necessarily news networks, and people would be like, "Oh, that's so earnest," and they meant it in a bad way, <laughs> like, "Oh, boy, that's so earnest." And now I think the well-reported, thoughtful stories are coming back, right? Look at all these networks that are doing interesting docs on people, the deep dive, the very heavy on the detail, strong on the reporting stories. So I actually think it's a really good time because I think for people who are journalists, you, you can go work on a movie, you can go work on a TV show, you can go work on a sitcom, you can go, right? And, and the skills that you get from journalism still apply and still are really important. So I, I actually think it's a very, very good time because the box is expanding. Journalism, I think, is struggling because they're trying to figure out, especially under President Trump, like how do you recover stories where there's just a huge thread of untruth and how do you not elevate lies while you're also trying to report them? And I think that's a big challenge a lot of reporters are, are struggling with. Um, so journalism, I think, itself is going through a, a, a big, and also we know that you know, uh, lots of journalism jobs are being lost in the wake of this coronavirus. So I think you're just going to see a real shift in the landscape. That's what usually happens when things like this happen. So um, this, the main reason, though, of course, that I wanted you to speak to my students was just the breadth of your career and the things that you have done. You have so much wisdom to give them. Um, but it was also because I wanted to pay tribute to our seniors. They're leaving. They won't oh, have I know. Time. My daughter's a senior. It's so oh, sad. Really? I feel so badly for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, she goes through moments of, uh, she goes through moments of, uh, of not caring and being okay with it. Not other moments of being just a hot mess. But seniors, you know, you got to come up with what's going to be the ritual for your end of year. And I don't know what that is yet. I haven't seen a good option yet, but I think there's going to need to be a thing. 
Well, today you are the thing. <laughs> because I love it. Yes. I love wonderful. being part of the thing. But I, <laughs> but I do think for seniors, and maybe it's just putting something together visually or, you know, some kind of storytelling. Um, I'm happy to be part of the thing, but I'm not the thing, the thing. Um, <laughs> because I think it's a big loss, right? It's you, yeah. You're missing out on something huge. And we're in the middle of a global pandemic. So like, oh my gosh crazy times yeah. um, but you will have a lot to be talking about and writing about and it'll give you a very interesting frame for all the work that you do so now i'm going to open the floor and you guys can ask questions i'll just go around in the room and pick somebody <laughs> so that way we're not talking sure. to each other okay so jacob you want to go first yep sounds great Sure, I guess. <laughs> um, thank you for talking with us today. Um, I don't know what that sound is, but uh, kind of a brief question. So, like, where did you first start out? And like, do you have any like um, advice for people like starting out? Yes, I sure do. I started working at WBZ TV in Boston, and I my job was to open mail get lunch. Um, I took out staples from the bulletin boards of the three floors of the station. And, um, and I did anything. And I think the advice, what worked for me and what works frequently is when you're just trying to get your toe in the door, because people hire who they know, you got to kind of just go in like, I'm willing to do everything. I had a young woman once who was my intern, and I asked her to get coffee. And the way it worked in our office was if I was in early, I'd get coffee for everybody. If she was in early, she'd get coffee or whoever, like whoever got, whoever was there and was free would get coffee. It was not a gender thing. It was not, it was just a who's free. And she informed me and she was my intern for a couple of days that, you know, she did not get coffee, that she didn't see as one of her jobs to get coffee. And I was like, okay, well, I don't use one of my jobs to write a, a good recommendation for you. I mean, like, what a silly thing to, to say, to do and to think about. Um, you know, to start your career with a, here's what I don't do, you know, versus, and listen, I'm a big believer. And if you find yourself being the coffee girl every day, that's a problem. But in our office, it was whoever's there, whoever's free. And I, it really soured me on this young, I felt badly who ever gave her that advice, right? Because I felt like, oh, someone has told you to do this. And all it's done is make me think you're not a team player and you're not help out. In my job, I run a company now. If the garbage cans are full, I get out the garbage bag and I eat the garbage cans. <laughs> it's my, my company, right? I mean, I do everything. I clean up the kitchen if I have to. I expect everybody to do that because we're in a shared workspace. So I, I felt badly because I, I wish that she had been that person who's like, I am here and if you need me to get coffee, or you need me to write a story, or you need me to research, or you need me to this weekend doing something, I'm here for you because I want this to succeed. I did that, and I think it was very, by doing that, I think uh, people felt like they owed me. So they would look at my scripts. And like, oh my God, Soledad was here logging tapes for me as a favor. So I better look at her script, or I better help her out with this, or assign her to that. It's a lot of quid pro. And I felt badly that I think she sort of came in with a lot of, here's what I don't do, which was a mistake. Mm. Good question and great answer. Um, Shay, because I'm just trying to call on our seniors first. Do you have a question that you'd like to ask? I did not know I was muted this whole time. Wow, you have to forgive me. <laughs> Well, that's the kind of day I was having on Zoom yesterday. I kept talking and everyone would be like, you're muted, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I know you kind of like spoke on like early experiences and when you, you were willing to be the team player, but like was there ever a time where it was this job that you just knew you wanted, but the requirements were maybe a little bit above what you had in terms of experience years when you were first starting starting out that you just went ahead and went for and got anyway just because you had the confidence or was that experience you had? Every job is like that, right? Every job puts in something. You need three to five years of this and blah, blah, blah. I guess I would say I just never stick to those. When you're getting a job, what you really need is someone who's going to go to the back for you. The thing I do is I look like, who do I know at this company? 
who do I know who can put in a good word for me? Sorry, I'm super noisy around here. You know, because no one's going to hire you or not hire you if you only have 3.5 years versus 3.75 year, right? It's People want to hire who they like, who they know. And so the step one is how do you know, who do you know in that company? Who can be you? And then you have to go in sort of maybe your mores. Do I really would like this job? And they'll say to you, oh, girl, this is not for you. Ooh, oh, you'd be amazing at this. And then the next question is, great, it's a new year. Because I used to ask people all the time, how do I get, you know, I love that job over there. What do I need to do to get that, to be, to be able to get that job in one year? And sometimes they'd say, oh, you can't get it in one year. You actually need to do this and this and this is more like a two-year plan. But I think it's about understanding. Jobs aren't just one day you roll in and it gets plopped in your lap or you fight for it and you get it. It's much more of your boss is knowing, oh, she wants a different job. Oh, she's willing to work hard to get this different job. Oh, often, I didn't even know you wanted that, right? Like I hadn't, I hadn't told them what I wanted. And so I got much better at being very clear, like, this is where I want to be. This is the kind of stuff I want to be doing. What do I need to do to get that? Frequently, it's volunteer. Help somebody out, right? Oh, you should hang out with Jane Doe. She does that all the time. That you in an interview because you can say, well, while I haven't worked in the field, I've been shadowing Jane Doe on my days off. And so I can talk knowledgeably about what it would take. And that puts you ahead of all the candidates who just say, well, you know, I really think I'd be good at this. So it's about, I think, you'll hear me use these words a lot, being strategic. What is the job? Is it the right job for you? What are the requirements? And then asking everybody, how do I get the job? What do you think I need to do? And sometimes the answer will be not fun. You can't get this job. They're posting it because they have no intention of giving it to anybody. This is a fake. <laughs> They're going to give it to the kid, the son of so-and-so. In fact, it's already, sometimes I've been told, I've already been given away. They were just posting it after the fact to look like they were trying to really post it widely. Okay, good to know. Now you just need to figure out, okay, how do I get that next one? How do people know that I want to be in that, in that um, chain for opportunities? Great. Um, Diamond? I always think clarity is the best. I mean, really, I think clarity is just being, you know, Often people don't want to be clear about things, but I actually have found when someone comes to me and says, hey, I'd like to do this, it starts a conversation about like what their role in my company is and where I see them going. Right. And sometimes the answer is, I just don't see that for you. And sometimes the answer is, great, wow, I have no idea you were interested. Fantastic, let's start working toward that. Um, I think that, that just once you're open, then you're at least having real conversations. I mean, and it also speaks to how important networking is. Um, do you want to focus on that a little bit? Sure. As I was saying a little bit earlier, a lot of these jobs are about who you know and that people know you, right? And so very rarely does someone just look at your resume and say, oh, sorry, it's amazing. We're going to hire you. They see your resume. They want to know who you know. They ask people about you. Oh, wait a minute. You worked with Jane Doe. We, they know someone who knows Jane Doe. They call that person up. That person says, well, let me reach out to Jane Doe. Jane Doe gets on the phone and says, oh, my God, she was amazing. Whew. That girl, back to all those things that I was just talking about, would come in on Saturday and would work really hard. And she would volunteer to shadow because she wanted to learn the job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So that's where all those things kind of come in because you're expanding your network and recognizing that you have to impress people every step of the way. That there's no version where you get to just, you very rarely do you get to just deliver your resume and get a job. It just doesn't work like that, especially in a very competitive field. So I always look at it like get in there and impress people. Show them who you are. Show them what you can do. And worst case, even if they don't have a job for you, they will be able to know someone who knows someone. The number of times someone has said to me, I'm going for a job at such and such company. Would you mind reaching out and telling them that I worked with you? And if I love them, I do it happily. And I tell them, you know, let me tell you how amazing this person is. She was great. And that's what people want to hear. You worked with her. Will she work in our environment well? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's so true. Uh, Diamond, do you have a question? If I may add on networking. I was going to add one quick thing on networking. Uh -huh. If you have a great relationship with somebody, one thing to do in networking is just keep in touch. I keep in touch by phone calls. Just drop a little tiny card. Hey there. 
Uh, just wanted to let you know that I passed that difficult class that I mentioned last year. Hey there, look, heading into my, you know, uh, junior year of college. Hi there, I thought you might want to know that, you know, here's a picture of me skiing. Remember that conversation we had at once? Just a way for people that when you three years later reach out for some kind of a networking thing, they know and remember you and know what you did. And again, it's just a little note and three to six months of just a check-in. Hey, I hope you're well. Just wanted to say as year ends how much I appreciated working for you. Just wanted to say as the year begins that I hope you have a great year. Super, super simple, but it's something that's worth doing, I think. Definitely. So, Diamond, did you have a question? Yeah, so my question is in regards to um, people in journalism going into grad school. I'm actually headed to Northwestern mm -hmm. still um, to get a Master of Science this fall. But I was just wanting to know kind of your viewpoints on that and if it helps and kind of what are the next options after that? Sure. Yeah, I think it can help. I think people often want people with some kind of expertise. So I think if you're getting a master in science while you're also being a practicing journalist or you can volunteer on projects or do things that help you all to become a journalist, I think that's really useful. I do think uh, the, the, the sort of rule of thumb when I was coming up was if you couldn't get a job, try to go into grad school because it was better and would give you more networking, more opportunities. I think going to J school is great, but make sure you're using all of those opportunities to network, literally. I mean, if you're not networking like a fiend, you're really missing out. So I, I think, you know, when you go to schools, it's a great opportunity because speakers come, um, you just have access to, to professors, and you might be getting your master's of science, but you should be loitering in the journalism department if you want to be a journalist or whatever you want to do, right? There's no reason you can't go to every fun thing that's being offered in any field that you might be considering, even if it's not your field of study. Sorry, I didn't clarify. It's a master of science in journalism. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so I think same thing. I think that's, I think that's great, and I think, you know, goal for me in graduate school or for people who are in graduate school is just to make sure you're eking value out of every second all the time. Okay, great. Good question. And Ryan, do you have a quick question? Um, I had it. <laughs> you want us to come back to you? Yeah, give me a second. Okay. All right. Danny, I know you've got some. <laughs> You're muted, Danny. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm bad at that. But I know. Uh, Story of Zoom. <laughs> yes. But I know uh, you moved like last decade from daily news to long form pieces. How is that transition? Mm. And do you prefer one or the other? No, I actually like the flexibility of doing both. Doing long form opened up a whole world for me in terms of being able to start a company years later because there's not a lot of journalists who go from daily news to being able to run a production company. Most production companies are creating content that's multi-part series, documentaries. Um, we do a little bit of reporting, but very little. So we, we wouldn't have a functioning company if all I did was do reports. It just, it, it, there's no financial model that makes that. So I was let go of the, I was anchoring a morning show and I was put on doing docs. It was pretty, I mean, it was super embarrassing, right? Because you you still have to anchor, even though you're no, you know, the New York Times reports that you've been fired on your show, but there you are still doing your show because you've got two weeks to still do it. And I remember just thinking very much like, oh God, I don't know if this is something I want to do. But back to the thing about being flexible, I'm very good at like, okay, well, I guess this is plan B. <laughs> okay. And I kind of jumped into it and ended up being probably the best decision of my life. And it wasn't one that I personally, you know, affirmatively made. Um, and it just, it, it allowed me, you know, now the work that I do is selling docs and series to HBO and other, you know, discovery and oxygen and also reporting when I want to. So I go back and forth as I want. Um, but uh, I think I love, I like having the flexibility to do both. But if I weren't doing long form, I don't think I'd be able to run a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. Madeline, did you have a question? Um, yeah. What would you say is like your favorite, like, era of your career that you've done like is it like 
working in morning news, would it be like what you're doing now? What would be like your favorite part of your job? Oh, that's such a great question. And I love the lights behind you. Um, I'm one of those people who I kind of, you know, what they say, love the one you're with. Like I'm a little bit like that. I mean, morning TV was miserable because you, I was in the office, usually between 2.30 and 3 in the morning every day. But I also, I just loved it. I loved doing a morning show. I can't imagine going back now. There is no way I would do that now. But I really did love it. I loved when I worked at CNN. I traveled all the time. I still travel a lot. I can't imagine being on the road and camped out for two weeks at a time, three weeks at a time. I just think that would be miserable now. But at the time, I, I thought it was amazing. And it was just a fantastic opportunity. Um, I like doing documentaries. Um, I don't know. I, so I, I kind of just, I've liked every opportunity. I think I'm a little bit nauseatingly optimistic. And I think as you get opportunities, you turn them into things you like or you leave them altogether if you don't like them. Um, but I think there's just sort of good positives in every single thing. So I, there's not one where I would say like, oh my gosh, it breaks my heart. My favorite show right now, I do a show that I love, which is called Matter of Fact. I am a correspondent on Real Sports um, on HBO. That is a greatest show. The people are so smart and that's really fun to be around just really, really brilliant people. We were nominated for an Emmy Award for a piece that I did. And uh, Brian Gumbel, thinkers that was telling me that he doesn't care about awards and awards don't mean anything. And I'm like, no, I love awards. I want to win. I want to win. <laughs> but it's a really, I mean, they've won every award over and over again. Really remarkable. And so it's been very fun to be in with that team. They're, they're fabulous. Cindy, you're muted. I think you're still muted, Cindy. Danny, are we the only ones not muted? Yep. Oh no. My next book is my, I'm gonna write a book called, I think you're muted. The story <laughs> of Zoom and the coronavirus era. <laughs> oh guys, if you have any more questions, just unmute yourself. I, I wanted to say I was muted. <laughs> Jean Miner is here with us. She's an advisor to our department, so we appreciate her being on. Um, the, anybody I'm else? Unmuted. Hi, nice to talk to you. <laughs> Any more questions, you guys? I do remember my question. Okay, go ahead, Ryan. Um, basically, like one of the things I want to do is kind of more like, like you mentioned, traveling and doing inter like international reporting. So like kind of just how do you balance that with everything? Sorry, I'm struggling to unmute myself. Um, uh, you don't, there's no balance. It's just completely chaotic and really fun and crazy and you live out of a bag and you never go to the gym and you <laughs> run around like a maniac. I thought it was so much fun and I loved it, but I would come home and I have to pay all my bills and meet all my friends. And it was just hard. It was really, really hard. But I loved being on the road. I loved reporting stories. I thought it was so great. During Hurricane Katrina, I'd spend about two and a half weeks living in RV on Cal Street. And then I'd fly home for two and a half weeks while my co-anchor would do the show from there. And so we swap back and forth, but there's no balance. You just need a really, really patient and forgiving spouse or boyfriend, mm -hmm. girlfriend, whatever, who's willing to, um, you know, pick up the slack when you're not around. But there's, it, it, part of the reason I'm, I'm glad I don't do it is because there was no balance. It was absolutely insane. Okay. Well, if you guys don't have any more questions, some Wait, of that I do. It's oh, more do? of a content okay. related question, but um, last semester, me and sure. Madeline in uh, Cindy's class uh, reported on food insecurity on our campus. And I was wondering if you had any insight going oh. forward about it because she uh -huh. told us like, you know, you did a whole investigative piece on it. And oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, you did. Wow. Um, I'm going to send you my doc. Um, on uh, food insecurity. We actually just uh, released a doc. It was actually supposed to be at South by Southwest, but of course that got canceled. Uh, so we weren't able to make our debut there. But it's a great looking at food insecurity. I mean, the data is crazy, right? You, I remember there's a quote 
from someone in my piece where she says, I thought it was just the sad story of a handful of see the data and how widespread it is. So it's a great story and a complicated story. I'm so glad to hear that you did that. If you guys would, through Cindy, send me your story, I'd love to, 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 to read it. I will send, turn through Cindy, uh, the link to our doc. I think it would be amazing. Well, we can definitely do that. We will, definitely. Yeah, we have a, a great bunch of students here. Perfect. And they're, they're, hard, love work, they're hard workers. And they also take part of, not only do they have classes and, and they work, but they also take part of our River Region newscast, which um, unfortunately now, because of uh, the pandemic. Oh, have, I love it. But we did four days a week, a 30 minute broadcast that's actually on PBS station. So it airs. Oh, how great. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. Oh, how great. Yeah. So would you like to give yeah, amazing parting words for them as they go out there and try to uh, make their dreams come yeah. true? Yeah. Well, first of all, I got to tell you, I'm so impressed by students your age because uh, I think you're just smart and hardworking. And I think you have very good bold detectors uh, in a way that I think some journalists my age, as I watch them try to figure out how to struggle to cover things, don't, haven't figured it out. So I think that's great. You also have access to a lot more platforms. You're much more technologically savvy, and you also have the ability to be very comfortable across a number of different platforms. So I, I think all those things are remarkable, amazing opportunities and advantages, frankly, that you're going to be able to leverage. The key thing I would say is just don't listen to other people's feedback on what's possible. I remember when I started looking for a job in 1987, somebody said to me, um, the evening news is dead. Well, guess what? The evening news is still on and it gets about 5 million viewers a night. So like, it, you know, that person was just wrong. They were just full of it. They were literally 100% wrong advising me who was a new young journalist trying to enter. And I'm, I'm glad that I didn't really listen to them. They were just wrong. And people are just wrong a lot. So if you have something you wanted to do, go and figure it out and figure it out like you would dig into any kind of a problem. Find the people who are doing it, find out how they did it, under, you know, dig into some of the challenges, how you work around those challenges and just ask serious questions. Okay, how do I solve this problem if I want to get to X? But the idea that there are certain things you cannot do in an environment where technology is cheap, where there's lots of access and opportunity and stories are happening all the time, you guys are really well positioned, so don't listen to the naysayers. I, I just think they're just completely full of it. That would be my advice. Well, um, thank you so much for being with us. I'm, I'm going to take your picture now <laughs> because I have to show off that you were so great and came in to be with us, and we really, really appreciate that. Uh, and thanks to your assistant and to Jill that helped make this all happen. Oh, I'll tell her. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the great questions, you guys. I really appreciate it. Okay. Stay safe. Stay six feet away from people. <laughs> Wear your mask. Is I have my mask on right here? <laughs> well, take care. And be careful, okay? okay? Bye, you guys. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. Okay, guys, I think that was a, a really good meeting. I hope you learned a lot and, and you're fired up. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to review our piece. You're going to yeah. review our piece, Teddy. No, that's a good thing. It's good. Uh, it's scary. It's feedback. No matter what she says, you're going to learn from it. That's the best thing. That's, that's the only thing. It's like, oh my God, she's going to see it. She's going to hear my voice. Oh no. Oh, that's, that's so good. But again, like, oh, she's yeah. literally the top person in our field. Like, Yeah. So send me your link and I'll make sure she gets it, okay? Okay.